Music and Monsters. You are watching Music and Monsters. Music and Monsters, the art of Jace Whitman. Please visit www.musicandmonsters.com. <laughs> start off with asking you, what's your favorite movie monster? Um, probably easily the original Frankenstein. So I'm Mine too. Boris Karloff. Yeah, yeah, Jack Karloff. Pierce. Yeah. The yeah. 31 yeah. Frankenstein. And it's yeah. funny because, yeah, you've seen, uh, uh, that's basically the thing that I paint and draw the most. Uh, Karloff, right. Frankenstein is the most. Right. And I, right. I tend to gravitate towards the original design. Uh, I like Bride of Frankenstein as a movie, but you know the monsters all scarred up in Bride, right? Right, and right. looks different. Totally. totally uh, different. So, um, while you're sculpting, do you listen to anything? Do you listen to music, or do you listen to podcast or radio? Yeah, I I um, I always listen to probably half the time music, and of all things, I listen to are the classic movie. Uh, soundtrack That's and, awesome. and, and, in, in, in particular for some reason in uh, which I'm a huge fan of are the Hitchcock movies oh I am too um, yes yeah especially uh, for some reason or not it's hauntingly beautiful the, the soundtrack from um, uh, Vertigo I yeah really, Vertigo is awesome yes yeah <laughs> I, so I listen to soundtrack not just that one but I listen to those and then half the time I listen to news or whatever, you know, whatever's kind of mindless going on. Sure. Uh, that that uh, kind of keeps me focused. Um, I, you know, because I've been in your, you know, both your shops, and uh, the one thing I was struck about uh, was the large format Lincoln heads that you've done. All right, all right. Yeah. Uh, have you ever considered doing a large format, like, monster sculpture like that? You know, I have actually considered it, but in all honesty, and it's probably the reason I'm not in the Halloween business anymore, the mm -hmm. Halloween business, as you well know, is it doesn't pay you for what you do. It, I agree, it yes. nickel and dimes you to death, and, and, yes. you know, and, and I can come from experience of you know, starting off with nothing and then becoming a public company. And, and, uh, and it just, it, it, it destroys you how they won't allow you to really do what you want to do if you want to make a decent living off of it. And granted, I did really well. Um, so with, is, is part of that, uh, well, I know the problems with distribution and working with a third party. I mean, that's that's a big problem. Um, what about rights issues? I mean, I know there's complicated rights going on, a lot of the classic monsters. Or, well, I, I'm just saying classic monsters. But. I had, I'll just try to summarize the best I can. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you're, you probably wouldn't be aware of this, but back in the early 90s, Universal Studios was falling apart with their licensing and most mm -hmm. people in the early 90s weren't doing that well sure and they gave me the right to the universal monsters wow. and that's when we launched all those universal classics and everyone in the world carried them and we did phenomenally well i've and seen some of those uh, i've seen the uh, Frankenstein monster with the like coming out of the wall or kind of tombstone type thing. All of those things we did. The, we did the decor. We did the mask. We even did some costumes, but not too many. Uh, but but we had the license to do all of that. When wow. Universal Studios uh, 
grew along with all the other licensing companies, and I, I'll put it mildly, basically became whores in the industry. <laughs> and it's whoever could guarantee the biggest upfront dollars. Yep. And granted, you know, I was a public company from 92 to 98, from 1992 to 1998. Yeah. And, I mean, we weren't doing like ten or 20000 We did like $8 million in just universal monster masks. I believe it. I mean, I mean, it was insane what we were doing. But it, it turned into, you know, your guarantee had to be X number of dollars. And what transpired from all of that, of course, is the attorneys have become very watchful. Yeah. And uh, granted, I've been removed from that industry, the licensing part of it, for you know quite a few years. But I, it was, it left the sour taste in my mouth, and not so much to be a licensor. It's just what, what they made of it that did not make it worthwhile. And then you had to deal with the client, the customers, who sure. nickled and dimed you. Yeah. That would not compensate for that. So the net result, I mean, fortunately, I left and walked away from that when it was doing well. But but I, I, I do keep an eye on the industry. I'm constantly looking just because I find it amusing. And it's interesting that I can say Frankenstein was one of my favorite characters, but I also feel like... All that has become kind of worn out yep. and repetitive and, and it's kind of, you know, I know I did it because I loved it just the way you love Harloff and all that. Yeah, it's exactly. It's a genuine feel for that. But the reality is out there. You're not, you got to question all the stuff that's being repeated. That's not true art. That's and, sure. and some people might not like it when I say that. But I've actually almost bought knockoffs from uh, Thailand. I, I'm sure you've seen it. Like Thailand does a lot of recasting, and yeah, it just yeah. comes down to like I couldn't afford the originals when they're out, and now they've some of them have gone up. And so you know, if I could pay sixty bucks for a knockoff or a recast, and then my thing is I want the blanks. So I want to paint it. Uh, you know, it's right. like a giant model kit to me. So yeah. that, that's affecting a lot. I've seen, I don't know if you paid attention to like Sideshow Toys. Uh, yeah, Sideshow I, Toys, does some, they've done some really cool stuff and I've noticed China is knocking them off now too. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's exactly that. It's a knockoff business and, and the, uh, the clients, you know, the ultimate retailers who sell this stuff don't seem to care about creativity anymore or they certainly right. don't want to pay for it and it all comes down to dollars and cents and I don't mean to sound like a curmudgeon on this but, but where I'm coming from is when I think about where I first started in this industry when I came onto the market in like 1988 yeah. 87 or no actually it was early what am I talking about it's like 1985 <laughs> and and everything I did those first four or five years was all original artwork. It wasn't copying a monster movie or someone else's artwork. And it was, and I did not mind working, you know, sixteen hours a day because you know you were doing your thing. And well, yeah, because you love it. Yeah. Yeah. And but but then, I mean, I I you know like. I got to be honest. I did love when the financial aspect when we became a public company during the years I did that. Uh, but creatively, it it became a game of well, how cheap can you make this because they're not going to pay for it. it. It was strange how 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 on the, you know. And as you know, there's there's the mom and pop shops which tend to want more creative stuff. Sure. And there's the big retailers who look for price points and to be safe. 
So, yeah. you know, it, 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 from exercising your creativity, I'm sure you can, but it's not like it once was at all. It reminds me when you're talking about dealing with these distributors and these third-party companies, a little bit of like what the record industry did to a lot of the recording artists, where I don't know if you're how aware you are of what the recording industry does to people. Uh, they charge what's called breakage, or the, at least they used to. Like, uh, they would take 10% off. Like, let's say if you had a record deal uh, and you're shipping 100,000 units, they would take 10% off of that for breakage. You know, basically right, assuming right. that... 10% returns. So they're yeah. taking that money off the top and then they're paying themselves. It's it's criminal. It's corrupt. Oh, no. And then the same with the Halloween industry and then now more than ever how they find you. They actually have departments. I'm talking about the big mass merchandise. Mm -hmm. Have these departments that their job is to find some kind of fault all the way down to the hang tag if it's not quite the right ink and then suddenly you got this big fine and and that's how they make their money i mean it's yeah that's fine. crazy it, it's Plus, not good the nature that they have people like that on staff and they're paying that person a salary and that's their career so it's right thing they got them their own stuff. government yeah yeah so they'll find um, something whether you like it or not <laughs> so uh did you grow up in the bay area yeah. i was born in oakland so so then you probably were a fan of Bob Wilkins like I was. Oh, yeah. I was on the show twice. Really? Oh, I had no idea. Oh, yeah. I was on the show. Actually, I remember this. I was, uh, I was like seventh grade. Um, and, and, uh, boy, I was in such awestruck when he asked me to come. I, I had sent in some images and whatnot and asked me to come down for an interview. And yeah, that was, and, he, and I had to, and believe it or not, which you probably believe, I made myself up as Frankenstein. But yeah, um, I believe it. Yeah, and then he showed all these other things I did, and, and it was, it was, uh, yeah, he, he was great. And then he had me come on a second time, uh, and that was pretty fun also. So, yeah, I got. Yeah, I was lucky enough to meet him when I was maybe eight years old uh, in San Francisco at the. I think it was the cinema shop. He was selling off his collection at that point, and no. uh, he was as nice as could be. I mean, you know. Yeah, totally nice. Yeah, and I, and I did the same thing where I'd follow him around to all the comic shops. That he'd make an appearance or something. And yeah. it was. You know, I always felt so honored. You know, you're you're in your teens and would call you by your first name and I was like oh god I practically wet myself you know yep. <laughs> yeah he was like my first rock star like I yeah, completely, exactly. <laughs> completely idolized that's him pretty funny. that's a good way of putting it um, so uh, it, one of my questions was have you considered designing monsters for horror films but I'm assuming because of your experience in the Halloween industry that kind of started like you're making too much money at that point I'm guessing um, I was doing very healthy living, for sure. Yeah. Um, so switching it up, uh, what's your favorite concert experience? Like concert? Do you have one? Yeah, a rock concert or music concert. I don't want to say rock. Anything jazz, classical. Oh, that's a that's a tough one because. Um, well, you're in Napa, so you have great concerts coming through all the time. Yeah, you know what's funny about that is is I really don't go to them up here, but. Mm -hmm. In my day, and not actually not too long ago, from uh, you know, I can probably age me, but I loved a, a concert I went to that was very intimate, a very small group of people with Boss Gag, mm -hmm. and and I and I also as far as kind of related on the same thing was when I saw the uh, New York play of musical play of Phantom of the Opera. Wow. I really, wow. really love that, and I think, and I, and I love the symphony and 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 different music. Um, kind of a kind of a throwback. I hate to even say this, or I don't hate to say it. I love Nat King Cole and Frank Sinatra. Yeah, and you know, I mean that's you know, I'm 
it's going to be 59 pretty soon, and yet I still love all that music. Well, um, we're pretty close in age. I'm 49 right now. I'm going to be 50 this year, so we're pretty okay. close. And <laughs> You'll I feel different up, at 59, trust me. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. I feel pretty different from 48 to 49, so I'm sure. But, um, yeah, I grew up, well, it's funny because my dad raised me on uh, all the crooners. And at the time, I really didn't like them, you know, because I was too young. I just didn't have the palate for it. Right, uh, I right. wanted to hear totally rock and roll, yeah. and I wanted to hear funk and soul music, you know. And But he really, like, he coached me. You know, basically, we'd ride around listening. He's like, who's this singing? I could tell him, that's Timmy Davis Jr. Or that's um, uh, Dino, you know. Right, right, like, right. It, it helped tune my ear. I don't know if he intentionally did that, but... Um, and the funny thing is, like, the only common ground that he and I had musically while he was still alive was Miles. And, like, Miles Davis is one of my all-time heroes. I like everything from Bitches Brew on. He likes everything before Bitches Brew. So, you know, we and had like some middle ground. About, yeah, I like everything about Miles Davis. Yeah. Uh, that's funny. I, I, uh, I actually grew up in a very musical family. I had a hard time with it. My dad was an accordion player, something that you don't want to tell the other kids when you're growing That's up. That's true. Yeah, you get beat. <laughs> and then later on, of course, you appreciate it. And yep. they had the family band and all that. And I'm tone deaf, so I couldn't. I, I, I mean, I, they tried to get me to play the trumpet, it just didn't work. And mm -hmm. you know, I'm a, I'm an artist, and that's what I do. And they were they were fine with that and very supportive. But, yeah, I, that's why we were constantly surrounded by music growing up, which I think is important. I agree. Uh, with your art, when you started, did you start with illustration or sculpture? It depends. Um, in some cases, I go straight to a rough maquette because I found that illustrations don't really always, especially the type of art I'm doing now, don't always... Uh, convey what it could be when people see the three-dimensionality of a model they get it yep. better but but I obviously I have to do concept illustrations yep and and I have this kind of like format that I use where I draw very quickly whatever it is and then move over to a maquette uh, of what it's going to be um, and that's usually how I go about it. And from what I've seen of your recent work, like there is a lot of emotion tied to everything that you do. Like it's <laughs> it's it's incredible. I mean, the scope first of all is incredible, and then your subject matter is incredible. Um, what drew you to you know your your paying tribute to um, let's just say the downtrodden? You know, I, I I'll tell you this. this the biggest turning point for me was 9-11, 2001. Mm -hmm. And my girls at that time were like five and three. And when that wow. happened, I remember thinking, what can I do to contribute something, no matter how small or how big, that helps people to get to know each other a little better. Yep, and I next, agree. I literally started, believe it or not, drawing, not making a model yet. I started drawing concepts that would become the Remember Them monument. And the whole wow. idea was based on, if you look at all these change makers and people who did things for other people, it came from every walk of life and not to get airy fairy here the night after 9-11 i had this amazing dream which seems so clear to me even to this day where all of this was just so vivid and clear and when i originally came up with this idea not only did people think i was crazy but internally in my own company, they said, well, that's a nice idea, but, you know, we got a company to run and all of this stuff. Yeah, they're and, asking where and, the money is. Yeah, and I persisted. And I would work even after work and um, 
and keep making the models and, and, and I had a really, you know, one of those aha moments with an unexpected visitor who hmm. came to the studio when we were in Oakland mm -hmm. and I had the models out there and I couldn't even tell you how she got wind of it, but it was Maya Angela. Wow. And she came in, she goes, I heard you do it. But someone in, in the network contacted her. And I, you know, was starting to choke up. I couldn't, I said, oh my God. Because she was in this concept. And I showed her the studio and everything. And and she looked at it, she started crying. And, and I said, you know, I feel I need to do this, but how am I going to convince anybody? And she said to me, just do the work and it's going to come. Because if you don't do the work, it isn't going to come. Someone is going to see it. But what ended up happening is a little bit later down the road, she was on my board for the Remember Them project. She brought in other people. and and But there were other people involved also. It was just like a domino effect. And of course, when Kaiser Permanente got involved, um, it made it totally real. So yep. making it real was the easy part. The hard part was dealing with the city of Oakland. Oh, and yeah, I can imagine. The right. art commission didn't want to have anything to do with it. And they, they even kind of like, you know, they were saying things like, oh, we don't advocate representational art where the avant-garde and we want modernist contemporary and it was just so full of bull yeah. and, and and so it took a project that should have taken three or four years to do and it ended up taking 11 years to do but I did it and it, yeah. it, it really was the trigger point that project that shifted me I I sold out my interest in the public company. I, I was completely, I mean, kind of on my own. And there was a certain yeah. number of the crew I took with myself and, and just felt I needed to do this. Everyone thought I was crazy initially. said, it's never <laughs> going to happen. And it happened. It cost $9 million to do. Wow. And, and um, you know, I can say... I will never forget when it was unveiled, there were like 5,000 people and it was, you know, I mean, some serious people. And it, within a couple days of that, everyone, President Bill Clinton to at that time, Governor Jerry Brown, who, by the way, Jerry Brown had a huge hand in making sure that I would get the proper to do it. Because if it wasn't cool. for him, I would never, never have gotten was, it. That when he was still in Oakland, he was in Oakland. It was a transition time because initially, yes, and then he finished his mayorship. But w when I showed him the project and the model was further along, and I told him, you know, this is what I want to do, but the art commission gave me a bad time, and he said, "Well, I'll fix that." He said, "I'm going to find uh, someone who has private land and." and uh, you can do whatever you want on private land, and then if you want to will it to the city, you can will it to the city. And that's exactly what we did. And, wow. and, and allowed that to happen. And so it's, I, I'm proud of that because that project, every day almost, I've been told every day, there's schools touring it, there are people from all over the world who tour it. Um, I believe it. The three presidents have visited it, a couple of them more than once. Um, and, and <laughs> I can tell you know, one that has not visited it. <laughs> yeah, I can't. I, I can't we don't have to say who it is. Yeah, yeah I, I think we're on the same page on that one. Um, but President Obama went there twice, and I was very honored to do that, just like I was honored that he came to when I did the slave memorial in mm -hmm. Alexandria, Virginia. Um, but then President Clinton came twice, and even President uh, Bush came um, and checked mm -hmm. it out. And then I 
gave a private tour to John Lewis, um, which was great. And just a lot, I mean, I, I couldn't even begin to name how many people who've been there and continue to go there. Um, so it's, it, it, it was my turning point, and also it was a turning point creatively because I was, I was hungry to, you know, I didn't want to copy stuff anymore. I mean, yep. the industry turned into the licensing industry of copycat and, and lawyer fees and things like that. And I said, you know, this isn't, this isn't going to make me do the things I want to do in life. And I don't feel like I'm contributing anything. Right. So I did that and, and I've, I've ridden the ups and downs of, of taking on what I do. And, and I yeah, can I mean, say I've, I've been have... I've been watching, admiring. Of course, you know, I'm a fan of your work, and <laughs> thank um, you. But I mean, I'm always amazed. Um, I mean, that's the sign of a true artist. Like you, you don't stay complacent. You're always pushing no, the boundaries. Don't stay complacent. <laughs> and uh, I drive everyone crazy with that. By the way, yeah. Um, so, on the kind of related note, um, what's one uh, let's just say notable figure or celebrity that's alive now that you'd like to have a cocktail with that you haven't. A cocktail that I have not had. Right, because I know you've had some with a few. More yeah, I, mean, I mean, we're doing projects for celebrities right now. Um, oh, that's that's a tough one. Um, I think just say like, uh, is there a musician or actor or director that you haven't met that you want to? I would say maybe uh, Martin Scorsese, Ooh. Um, and maybe maybe I would be happy to meet him. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I got a, a different view from most people of the movie industry. And contrary to what a lot of people know, I've been involved in some, and and a lot have yanked my chain, and yeah. is, and and have learned it's not exactly what you think it is. Um, I always wanted to meet Viola Davis, and lo and behold, I'm got a very nice commission working for her right now. Wow! And to, and to be able to spend time with her and hear her life story, which is beyond what any movie script could could capture i bet and i mean it's pretty i'm doing the viola davis theater for rhode island college and it's you know it's really you know it, it's it, it's an amazing project and they've given me a tremendous amount of creative uh parameters to work from and and uh you know so to me i would like to meet Martin Scorsese. I've met Francis Ford Coppola, which I found out his grandmother and my great grandmother were sisters, which was kind of cool. Holy crap! Wow. And, and he did a uh, family reunion. Um, this is this goes back a, quite a few years, and sure. we find out that we're related, which is kind of cool. Um, but yeah, and in, in I'm sure you've seen, I've been very fortunate enough to spend a significant amount of time personally and professionally with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yes, and, and I've seen the sculpture that you did for him for the, the is it Mr. Universe or Arnold Classic? I forget what it's called. Yeah, but that's one of the projects that we're yeah. doing. And then there's a couple of other ones that we're doing right now. Um, and he comes here on a pretty regular basis, and and I have to say, you know, contrary to what you know, the, the uh, marketing world or whatever you want to call it. The, the well, I've I've read his autobiography, and I was very curious how he would handle certain topics, and especially his governorship, and that made me like him even more because he is totally well, as you know, he's totally honest, he's upfront. He's not the typical politician, and like he explained what he wanted to do and what the problems were. You know, because I live in Sacramento, I saw him quite a few times. I never actually met him, but I saw him quite a few times down here. The first thing, of yeah. course, that I noticed was he's not as tall as he says he is. 
<laughs> yeah, no big deal. <laughs> well, he no explained one that to me. He explained that to me. And he, yeah, it's a competitive he, thing. He he had a degenerative uh, disc where he lost two and a half inches of height, uh, and that was due to um, doing too many squats. Yeah, that I believe it. it became arthritic. Um, so he's about five ten right now, five yep. right around there. So he's still not short. Right. I will tell you this: I've never seen anyone who's as thick boned as he is. Sure. Which accounts for you know that's a direct relationship to how big your muscles can be. Right. Um, but he he really you know he took me on a ten day thing Barcelona. I don't know if mm-hmm. you, you know he wanted me to see the Gaudi architecture, and I got to travel with him for ten days, which mm-hmm. is the most amazing trip of my life. I can honestly say that and. To, you know, to have every meal with Guy yep. and be with him constantly and and hear and, you know, I, I had got to know him before that, but I really got to know him after that. And he also comes to my unveilings um, uh, that make the most sense. And he, you know, he, I never asked him to speak, but he always peaked, which is pretty tremendous. And he, he um, got to... So, uh, I just want to ask you, just just from my impression of him, just from not meeting him at all, uh, he strikes me as someone that is very generous with his time Dream. with fans. Yeah. And uh, uh, you know, I've had I've had a lucky experience of working with someone that is well known, but not like his level. And I learned a lot from that guy. Um, mm-hmm. Just where I mean this was a guy that was recognized everywhere he went and um, but would stop and take time and talk to people like every single time and it was amazing you know it's like well, I can tell you firsthand Jace that um, there are things he does that really is very touching every time we go to a restaurant and you know he comes to Napa probably mm-hmm. every couple of months to review stuff with me and we were in a every time we've been in a restaurant he goes out of his way to say you know to pose or talk with the bus boys or bus girls the dishwasher and he always tells <laughs> yeah, me I once was, the word I is was out, one of yeah. you I've yeah. also known in, in particular when I was in Barcelona he would never refuse when a young child or old person would come up to him. And, and keep in mind, this is in Europe. Um, when he told me we're going to have 12 bodyguards surrounding us at all times, I thought, God, this is overkill. And it was anything really. but that. I mean, it was people crashing into us. I mean, it was like out of a movie, no pun intended. Yeah, he's like the Beatles. In Europe especially, I mean, he is here also, but there's a different reaction in Europe. You're very correct. He's like the Beatles in Europe. Over here, it, it, i got to say, it's, it's sometimes awkward, and I don't know how he stay, keeps his cool. Or we're sitting there eating breakfast. This was just a couple of months ago. Mm-hmm. And, and some people, like, throw themselves with their camera in his face trying to yeah. get a selfie and, and like totally handled it really cool doesn't get mad or anything but he he is extremely generous and and he doesn't brag about all the charitable things he does but yet he does an enormous amount of charity work yes and and it just it, I feel very honored that I've been I able think to get uh, to know him. I think that's part of it I mean the European attitude towards celebrity versus the American attitude towards celebrity is completely different. Uh, American yeah. has, you know, what they call haters. That yeah. If you're famous, you know, they just want to tear you down. They want to see you yeah. fall, and they want to pick at you, you know, whatever it is. And, you yeah. know, if you're lucky enough to get big enough, you're going to have a lot of them. And yeah. Um, yeah, I think he, that's is, very accurate. he is the biggest target in the U.S. right now. Oh, well, you know, I don't mean, I, I just mean that, you know, uh, the guys want to act like they're tougher than him. It's like, come on, the guy's like 60-something. 
50. He's also, 72. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. Okay. It's funny because I watch, you know, I, I study what he's doing and uh, I see him training in the gym now and it's like, ooh, be careful. And I make take note, it's like, okay, his, his arms are humongous again. And he's not doing like super heavy weights, he's doing light weights. It's like he knows what he's doing. No, and, and in fact, I'll just digress for a second. I had asked him, well, what what program should I be on at my age and all of this? And and he he put me on a program mm-hmm. of, of 100 push-ups a day, 200 with no weight, and 200 sit-ups. And I that will get you that, ripped. Yeah, I'm just not squats. ripped, but I will tell you this. I started that four years, maybe five years ago when you told me about it, uh-huh. and it made a huge difference and he told me if he could have done everything over he would not have lifted as many heavy weights as he did or as many repetitions and he would have been much more modest about it but yeah so that was well he, he had the, pretty, he had that champion mentality like he had to be bigger oh, yeah. and better than everybody which is yeah. why he is what he is yeah uh, and, and he's been great I mean I, I feel truly honored that he took a, an interest in me and actually it goes back to the second Terminator movie when they brought me in to do the sculpting for a, a collector's edition it was done directly with him wow. and he never forgot that and 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 uh, you know many years later when I moved to Napa I'll never forget the first month we were here Mm-hmm. Low and below, <laughs> he shows up at our door with a mutual acquaintance who led him here. And he said, oh, I got all this stuff we want to do and talk about with art and get going on it. And and it's been really pretty amazing. That's uh, awesome. Yeah. So on a semi-related note, because I've seen pictures of Chuck at your shop with Arnold. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, he was funny here story? one of What's the funny story you have about Chuck Jarman? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> just pick one. He's, he's a living cartoon character at times. I know he's just it. a really good guy. And I know he has a, a true passion for Halloween. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's, that's, I think it's safe to say that's what he lived for. It is. Um, he's always, that's why he and I are such good friends. Yeah, he's always been very funny, um, and you know, I, I I couldn't tell you an exact funny story. Um, he he just the way he went about everything was always kind of, and, and he always was very upbeat and uplifting and yeah, uh, pretty funny guy. And he is, I know he, I know he loves the classic monsters i know he's got an affection for killer clown yeah um, and and that's that's kind of his his thing and and god bless him that he can continue to do that yeah i don't i don't know if you know that i worked for him at his shop for a while and um even up to you know a couple years ago i would go out to his house and help him pour resin or and sand sand his uh his creations and all that stuff, even painting some of that stuff, which was really cool because, you know, he's one of my best friends. And right, that right. He, he and I, uh, you know, we just geek out and watch movies all the time. And, you know, he ended, because he's the same age as I am, and he gets all the same right. pop references. And so, you know, while we were uh, working, I would do really horrible impersonations of Arnold and Sly. <laughs> and... Uh, he would hear me in the other room start screaming, you know, like Arnold. <laughs> He's like, what are you doing? So, yeah. Anyway. Well, yeah. Uh, I, I remember Chuck when he first started to me with me in the Concord shop. He was, you know, he, he was pretty new at doing what he did and came yeah. a long way. Um, I know his thing is monsters. And, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um. Here's a weird one. What's your favorite Western? Favorite restaurant? No, Western. That's, like uh, oh, Western. Western film. You know, uh, Cowboy Oh, movie. okay. All right. Um, ooh. 
I would just say any John Wayne. Because okay. I love John Wayne. Okay, fair enough. Uh, yeah. Final question. Uh, what's one question you'd like to ask me? Anything you want. Um, what, what do you plan on doing with your artistic endeavors? Uh, that's a good question. Th that's a long, complex answer because <laughs> I do I a lot of different things. So, uh, short story or the short answer is I have uh, I'm selling my art, original art, at a wine and chocolate festival coming up this Sunday in Lodi. Uh -huh. um, I'm selling, you know, I'm my own boss, so um, I, I don't pay <laughs> I don't pay myself very well, but um, not yet. Um, I'm, you know, I have my own company. Um, I've started doing limited signed prints. Uh, you've probably seen them on my Facebook. Right, right. Um, and they look beautiful. Thank you. Uh, let's see. After that, I have a feature film that I started shooting, oh man, 2006. Uh, I wrote it, directed it, did the makeup effects. I'm editing it. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm going back to it. Uh, that is a total long story. There's a whole book in that. Um, basically, I thought that the film, I mean, because it's a horror anthology, and I thought that the film was cursed because all of these horrible things started happening in my personal life mm -hmm. while I was trying to film it. You know, just one guy trying to, you right. know, I, I made every mistake that a rookie would make. I was totally green, and uh, that's actually how I met Chuck, um, just mm -hmm. because you remember his... Goblin Closet shop in yeah. uh, Benicia. Yeah, uh, I lost one of my locations at the last minute, and I had my actor coming in. Um, remember Richard Mull from Night Court? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, he's he's like my my main actor that's in the film, mm -hmm. and uh, so <laughs> Richard found out to the grapevine because um, he was dating. Uh, a friend of mine that was also in the movie uh, and she found out because I talked to her about losing the location and so I got a call at my friend's well I'm over at my friend's house and I could tell it was Richard on the phone and he says so I hear you're you've lost the location what are you going to do I was like don't worry because he was scheduled to come into town like within two weeks I was like I got it covered <laughs> you know I'm lying to him just telling him <laughs> anything to 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 uh make it okay because mm. I couldn't lose him at that point and he knew I was first time director and would tell me you know, it's very naive you're very green you know he's like but I want to work with you it's like okay so um, I literally had to go uh, walk around and ask people I knew if they knew of a place you know of basically a retail store that I could film at because the story that I was shooting took place in a movie memorabilia store and um, Richard character was going to be a patron that came into that store and just through the grapevine I talked with uh, a friend of mine who's a horror host named Mr. Lobo I don't know if you've heard of him uh, then he said what about Goblin's Closet and it's like I've never heard of it it's like have you ever heard of Chuck Jarman it's like no he's like uh, <laughs> you should call them and tell them what you want to do and I said, okay. I called and left a voicemail. Chuck called me back and he's like, huh, you want to shoot here? And I was like, yep. Yeah. He's like, uh, how long would you need? And I told him. Uh, and I told him I had Richard Mole coming in. He's like, okay. And I found out afterwards that I'd already, I owned some of Chuck's masks. Like I was buying Bump in the Night masks. I just didn't know who he was. And so that's how that all started. Uh, but after all of this, I'm uh, I'm going back to doing a final edit on this movie, you know, this anthology thing, and it, oh, it's going cool. to be independently distributed or distributed through me, my company, um, because the things I've learned from the people I look up to, it's like never give away your art or the rights to your art. Yeah. If you have something original, own it, own it. And uh, yep, you're so I'm going right. to own it, and then uh, you know I'm doing the soundtrack for it because I'm crazy. I could do all these things. Um, uh, I haven't started doing the poster art, and the poster is going to be my magnum opus. It's kind of my 
you know, I haven't really been seriously drawing or painting since since the stroke. I'm easing myself back into it like very slowly. You know, I have, I still have some physical remnants uh, from that. Mm -hmm. uh, my, uh, I have aches in my back that I didn't have before. You know, I'm also 49. Yeah. Uh, my balance is off. Uh, sit for about an hour, I could stand for about an hour and then I have to take a break. So. Well, I commend you for making the comeback you did because as you know, um, some people aren't able to come back all the way. Oh, I know. I know. Also, uh, uh, my wife and I are in talks. Or, well, we're, we're, we're in talks with each other. We're putting together a TED Talks about what I went through and how I came out of it. And Oh, excellent. excellent. And um, we've got people through the hospital that I rehabilitated through that are trying to connect us right now. So we told us, uh, we told them the concept, which I think is pretty cool. So my wife is uh, a stand-up comedian and a, a MC wow. entertainer. Yeah, and a tech, technical guru, you know, as her day job. And so that's actually how we met, you know, because I'm creative. It's really hard to, you probably know, it's hard in relationships if you're super creative, you know, to find somebody that can understand how the creative mind works in a relationship. Uh, you know, I could yeah. be moody. I need a lot of time to myself. Uh, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, I can relate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's about yeah, it. Sounds, sounds like you got the perfect mate there. I do. Uh, we got married on September 13th, Friday the 13th of 2019. <laughs> well, of uh, course. Which was also a full moon. So it's like, yeah, that's the time. You know, Chuck and Amanda got married on Friday the 13th as well, like December 13th. And we're like, well, we can't do it on that Friday the 13th, you know, so we ended up doing a different Friday the 13th. Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I'll take no comment on, on... Oh, wait a minute. No, I'm confusing. I'm sorry. I was confusing uh, Chuck with his first first wife. Sure. Oh, and No, Amanda. No, Amanda's great. Yeah, yeah no, Amanda's so awesome. We're, yeah, so that's enough. You know, so I guess that's good luck then. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. I had a brain fart. Sure. Yeah. Eight names. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. first wife. Yeah. So, okay. But I think that about covers it. It's been awesome right. talking with you, and yeah, I've learned Great a lot about you, you that I wanted to know, and so All right. uh, we'll talk again. Okay. All right. All right. Talk to you later. Music and Monsters. You are watching Music and Monsters. Music and Monsters, the art of Jace Whitman. Please visit www.musicandmonsters.com. Thank you.